crop. I mean, as the EU as a whole, it's an old project somehow dating back even to the beginning of the 20th century as a pan-European state. But what the reality is now are Maastricht Treaty and Lisbon Treaty or Treaties, right? These are, right? These are somehow the basis for the EU functioning. And when we look at like the Lisbon Treaties, a tough book of rules, and when we look uh, at the current situation, I mean, just in the middle of the COVID crisis, the EU Commission worried with a sort of uh, unexpected delay. European par Parliament in Strasbourg somehow was frozen for quite a few weeks. And now we have Maastricht treaties, we have Lisbon, uh, Maastricht treaty or Lisbon treaties, uh, and still we are in the middle of somehow unknown, right? At least we start discussing financial matters, which is important. But according to you, what would be the future of Europe? Because now it's like national states are back, borders are back. The, somehow all divisions between East and West or North and South within the European Union are back. So somehow we would have like, not union as a whole, but a group of countries cooperating with each other and some of them somehow restraining from cooperation. And still we have the treaties, right? So what is your opinion about the future of the EU? Do we need a new treaties, a kind of a new opening for the union? So it's not just a switching one person for another uh, so it's not that Ursula von der Leyen is now in charge, but simply something in a, let's say, longer perspective. Do we need a re revision of treaties? Because new member states or future to be member states are also uh, somehow uh, uh, waiting to, to be accepted or just waiting for a sort of answer from the EU, right? And no one knows what the outcome is supposed to be. Thank you very much for your clever question. Let me uh, answer you with um, a Latin, a Latin um, paradigm. We are going to move from a crisis to a catharsis, <laughs> well. and, um, and 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 I fully agree with you. You you have sketched a, a wonderful picture of how the th the things happen. And, and how is the current situation? Because uh, I have to confess you that we are still here thanks to the European Central Bank. <laughs> well. I didn't mention this, the European Central Bank, but, but it shows that the projects of the European integration, as far as it is now written in the treaties, work. Because the European Central Bank is taking very important decisions on a legitimate basis. And the European Central Bank, in the former and the latter decisions that has have been taken, uh, the latter the, the last week, has underly, underlined its autonomy, its independence, and its strong commitment against the intromission of the Bundesverfassungsgericht <laughs> with, <laughs> with a decision that was out of the question, out of the matter. And, and you know also better than me that this decision has been taken against the political tendency and the political beliefs of the German government. It has been a very strange decision adopted in a very bad moment. But despite of it, the European Central Bank has shown not only to the member states of the European Union, but to the whole world, that we are working seriously in a project. It is obvious, and I, I said it at the, at the end of my short sketch of the picture after COVID-19 pandemic, that we, we need new treaties. New mm -hmm. treaties that I hope, I presume, that the next year, if the sanitary conditions uh, let, it, let it be, um, 
uh, we will have a European convention. We will have a new intergovernmental conference and we will have new treaties in two, three years. And what will be the content of these treaties? We have to differentiate the political and the financial and economic aspects of European integration. Regarding to political integration, I think that the treaties will refocus all the things that are uh, relate to the role of the European Parliament in the European Union, the role of European citizenship, the role of civil society, and will reinforce the supremacy of the European Court of Justice as the last speaker when we are talking about the implementation of European Union law. And on the other hand, we will have uh, a new foundations to uh, a new financial and economic integration in Europe, because it is obvious that not only from the perspective of the composition of the budget and the objectives of the budget of the European Union, Union that I, I can tell you, we will have European taxes for the first time in the history. We oh. will have European taxes. Like general European tax, right? General European taxes. Um, okay. I think we will have taxes um, uh, regarding to um, the protection of the environment. Uh, uh, I think we will have taxes regarding the big technologic companies in the world. And this will be new ways to get money for the budget. A lot of money that obviously will lead to make many different things uh, 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 from, the, from the European budget. You know, so that should be one, in, in my view, one of, 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 of the most relevant uh, um, changes that we will see in the, in, the, in the short term. But on the other hand, we will see also uh, the creation of some infrastructures that they are not well established now in the treaty regarding the function of the uh, 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 um, public uh, policies uh, um, in the European Union. In, if, if, if you analyze the European Union in, in economic terms, you will agree with me that in the last years, the European Union has played a very, very, very um, uh, hard political uh, uh, option uh, regarding neoliberalism. The European Union, in the last uh, years of the, of the 20th century and the beginning of, 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 of this century, has been more preoccupied regarding the liberalization of several sectors that after the pandemic, you have to agree with me that <laughs> we all know that are key to save the population of the European countries and, and to save the economic foundations of the European Union countries. And now uh, the European Union have to refocus all this uh, neoliberal approach into much more public policy approach. And it's going to be very interesting because, you know, what sector will be uh, uh, preserved under the neoliberal uh, perspective? Probably some regarding the four fundamental freedoms free movement of capitals, mm -hmm. uh, free movement of goods, because we need strong competition, mm -hmm. provision of services, but some, some services. I think the European Union will draft uh, in, the, in the next future uh, new uh, foundations for 
a European industrial policy, which will not be uh, founded only on uh, private uh, foundations, but will be supported by public policies and public money. This is the same regarding to the protection of health. This is the same regarding to the creation of new drugs and, and so on. So it's going to be a very interesting moment for Europe because it's not just democracy. And uh, uh, what we are looking for now in Europe, we, we have, I think, I always say to my students, you are privileged. You are living in a country that have four levels of protections of human rights, the human rights, the constitutional one, the European Union, the Council of Europe, and the OSTE. So you are privileged in the, in, in the world. Obviously, we can always be more democrats. We can always bet for better mechanisms to protect human rights. But I don't think that that should be now the problem. That was the problem before Maastricht and after Maastricht. And that, that, that is one of the reasons why we have Maastricht and we have Lisbon and we have Nisa. But mm -hmm. now we are approaching another dimension, an existential, existential mm -hmm. dimension of the union, which is security, which is health, which is protection of the population against poverty. Because you know better than me that the economy around the world is changing. And now labor force is losing the contribution to the national and European budget. If you wish that your citizens love the European project, you have to engage your citizens in the project. And this is not only, which is it's a lot, defending human rights. It's also defending dignity. And dignity of human beings has a strong connection with our role in society. You have to have the right to have a job, to save, to, to, to shape uh, your life according to rational perspectives and not to let millions and millions of people living just with some uh, uh, grants, you know, from the state or from the European Union uh, without a future. And this is an existential key question for the European Union. Mm -hmm. And I am sure that uh, the civil servants of the European Commissions, uh, many, many of the civil servants in the European Parliament, the Central Bank, and some other institutions are now working to reshape the uh, function of the union and to draft the future union according to these necessities. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. That was uh, very promising. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, more questions? If we are done with questions, so let us go on with our conference proceedings. And it's my pleasure to invite uh, Anna Danilchuk, um, a member of our project team, with her report running under the title New Challenges for the European Union Communication Strategy. Um, Anna Lanardina, the floor is given yes. to you. So Thank welcome. You very much. The screen is given to me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irina Pavlovna. And uh, I think uh, I, I do like this kind of conversation that we have right now. So maybe my report will also take this uh, shape. And when we thought of the topic uh, challenges for uh, new challenges for the EU communication strategy, uh, COVID was not yet a problem for the planet. <laughs> And uh, perhaps nowadays it is. Um, I mean, the pandemic is the greatest challenge for all the communication strategies, especially in supranational organizations. But I would like to start with a brief um, 
analysis of our project uh, because it was interesting for us and for our students because uh, it combined uh, the work of two teams. One team is of our university uh, from the non-EU country and our colleagues from the EU university in Lithuania in uh, uh, Vytautas Magnus University. And it was very interesting for us uh, at the beginning of this project to see how uh, many things about the European Union our students know. And uh, definitely, especially right now, uh, the idea, the dream to join European Union is uh, uh, fixed in the constitution of Ukraine. But we cannot say that European Union and information about the European Union is present uh, in, I mean, um, a lot of information is present in Ukrainian media or in the curriculum of Ukrainian uh, universities. Uh, I remember one meeting with the head of the Lithuanian mission to Ukraine uh, and our students were asking questions and one of the first questions uh, was, um, so when, uh, will we uh, join Europe? And uh, his answer was that the first thing we have to understand is that Ukraine is already a part of Europe, historically, geographically. And uh, uh, to, I did like the, uh, one of the final phrases in the Professor Moreira's report when he said that if you want to, uh, the project to be successful, you have to engage the citizens. And um, the EU communication strategy is focused on this citizens' engagement. And the focus in my uh, report will definitely be not just on the EU, EU strategy, but also this Ukrainian aspect that are present in uh, EU communication with Ukraine, about Ukraine. And uh, actually, there are lots of things and challenges and problems that we share with the European Union. And uh, again, our students were surprised to see the results of Eurobarometer that showed that things that the citizens of the European Union value the most about the Union are uh, very similar to those that Ukrainian citizens see as the priority of joining the European Union. And that was security, uh, that was mobility and absence of borders, something that we don't have now, but maybe uh, after the crisis passes, we will joy, uh, enjoy uh, mobility again. And uh, surprisingly, uh, the possibility of uh, education in uh, Erasmus generation, traveling, uh, academic mobility, and so on. Uh, we may say that definitely after the Ukrainian revolution of dignity uh, since spring 2014, Ukraine has embarked on an ambitious reform program and um, the European Union took an active part in that process and these priority reforms include the fight against corruption, judicial, constitutional and electoral reforms, improvements of the business climate and energy efficiency and reform of public administration, including uh, decentralization. And uh, a new turn in communication and in relationship of Ukraine with the European Union took place in 2017 when the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement entered into force. And of course, there are some extremely important and fundamental freedoms that uh, are fixed in this agreement, but also it pays specific attention to communication, cultural exchange, education, and that's what we can feel uh, in our field of work. But perhaps one of uh, the most important steps in EU-Ukraine relations was visa labor I'm sorry, I always have problem liberalization with a free regime. Our students love that. We love that because it uh, gives more opportunities to travel and uh, to visit real conferences. And also it's it works perfect uh, to, I don't know, um, in many... Um, I think it even enhances creativity and the desire to collaborate and start new projects. 
and definitely it facilitates people to people contacts and uh, people to people contacts are seen as uh, an extremely important aspect of the eu ukraine communication uh, strategy and uh, uh, it was uh, it is again extremely important that ukraine participates actively in eu capacity building and academic mobility schemes of erasmus plus and uh, this brings new international and intercultural experiences to our students and staff and uh, uh, they learn more about the core institutions of the european union and that's important because for uh, a very long period of time uh, the discussions about european union rotated just about uh, some i don't know salaries or jokes like after the uk leaves ua has to enter because <laughs> of this abbreviations that are quite similar uh, but nowadays just a brief uh, statistics over 10000 academic exchanges have been granted in 2015 20 2019, more than 7,000 incoming from Ukraine to Europe and almost 3,000 students from Europe to Ukraine and this is very important and in our, at our university we are very glad when students from the EU uh, visit our university uh, because our students love traveling but this is a way to show them our country, taking into account that the eastern part of Ukraine is uh, in conflict with uh, Russia. It's extremely important to show to EU students that Ukraine in general is a safe country, is a European country that shares core values of the European Union. And we are always grateful for this uh, opportunity. Uh, many students already um, won scholarships, uh, for master students and uh, 23 doctoral candidates from Ukraine followed Erasmus Mundus joint degree programs uh, since 2014. And uh, also uh, uh, we mm, support, uh, European Union supports key competences and skills of young people, their active citizenship, social inclusion and solidarity through specific actions in the field of youth. Ukraine takes an active role in Erasmus Plus projects promoting youth exchanging and volunteering, cooperation, networking and peer learning activities. Uh, many young people and youth workers from Ukraine participate in joint Youth Erasmus Plus youth projects, uh, policy debates, volunteering, and so on. But um, as the title of uh, my report is focused on uh, challenges of this um, communication strategy, there are lots of topics that are not yet covered uh, in EU Ukraine communication and need to be. Uh, verbalized, discussed, and uh, both in the European Union and inside of Ukraine. Uh, these questions that I have started with, when will we become Europe, or this is something, uh, a serious communicative strategy, communicative policy plan, um, have to be uh, designed here in Ukraine, showing that we are a part of Europe and we share uh, European identity. Of course, real and uh, hybrid war with Russia <clears throat> causes lots of internal and external problems and uh, taking into account the fact that modern wars, they are mainly informational wars and not many uh, Ukrainian uh, newspapers, TV channels, broadcasts in English and lots of things, lots of top topics stay uncovered. Also, uh, Ukraine, as many other uh, post-Soviet countries, suffers from uh, communist heritage and our Lithuanian colleagues and Hungarian colleagues often share problems uh, of this vision that is still sometimes <clears throat> present, us against them. And a uh, lack of information about the EU key institutions and their work in Ukraine. Projects like ours uh, help to uh, eliminate this gap. And uh, we discussed with uh, other Erasmus project uh, teams that perhaps it would be wise to add information about the EU to all the uh, levels of Ukrainian education, maybe at school, um, students have to know more 
if uh, <clears throat> this is our future. And a lack of information about Ukraine in the European Union med media, and we have to uh, learn how to be interesting, how to attract attention, to hold different interesting cultural uh, festivals or uh, platforms for communication. Uh, also, a problem is absence of supranational European Union media in Ukraine and only some uh, top newspapers or informational web pages have tabs dedicated to EU uh, politics and news. And uh, one more thing that we uh, can fight is lack of English and other EU languages proficiency. Uh, this is what prevents uh, much communication between different institutions. Uh, but I see that Ukraine uh, does a lot to change it. And now university standards and professional standards pay specific attention to the knowledge of English and other EU languages. Uh, definitely COVID is one more uh, problem uh, in that is a problem that uh, causes uh, restrictions in our um, communication, but uh, from Ukrainian perspective, perhaps the possibility to participate in various international conferences uh, grew, <laughs> I would say, and that's what we experience right now. And of course, there are some other common uh, challenges of uneven development of regions, uh, urban development and uh, um, climate change. Uh, lack of direct communication, uh, state, supranational organizations. But I do believe all of these uh, challenges uh, are not uh, very serious. And knowing them, uh, knowing their diagnosis, we uh, can change it all. Uh, so uh, this is just a brief outline of the problems we see here in Ukraine. And But we are... Um, I can say, me and Irina Pavlina, we were fascinated with when we started uh, analyzing the communicative strategy and the language policy of the European Union. We thought we uh, knew a lot, but then we realized that we, we didn't. And uh, there are lots of things that we discovered and we decided to implement in our academic life. And uh, we understand uh, how many steps the country, the university, the city must take to um, come closer to the standards of the EU. And if we see association and integration as our uh, future, so there is much work to be done. But uh, we believe uh, we can succeed. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Lendartivna. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, you know, uh, after your report, I started loving our project even more and a project team. And uh, obviously, it's good to know that even though the project is coming to its end, but nothing is really going to end. And we will keep teaching European Union language policy course to our students and to school teachers. And that's a good possibility for us to be associated with the EU related issues and uh, to be a part of uh, the EU in our our own personal way. Let's not wait for some political decisions. I'm sure they will come up very soon, but we are still there. We are already there, right? Yeah. Thank you. Now, questions, please. Yes, please. Just let me ask you. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Questions. Yeah. Ready? Yes. <laughs> okay. I hope. <laughs> anyway, just, uh, well, it's a very interesting program you're running, so I must say. Anyway, just I wonder, is there any, are there any preferences as far as the international policy of cooperation is concerned? I, I mean, uh, no, is there any preferences in sending students to study abroad and where, to what countries, and uh, so exchange the faculty, professors? This is one, one issue. The other one, uh, you mentioned in your presentation, well, that uh, you face some deficit in English uh, proficiency, let's say. Uh, so, what are the steps, uh, preventive steps, somehow to uh, level up or deepen the knowledge of students? Are there any program or um, 
is there any uh, special course in in the curriculum you offer to your students which would somehow help them well as you mentioned um, improve uh, their language and their professions mm -hmm. proficiency mm -hmm. so that's that's what I want to ask you about thank you very much for your interesting questions and uh, here is the answer to the first question um, we are happy to live in the EU bordering region and I can say that our students love traveling and uh, they are very much interested in various mo academic mobility programs because when we have meetings with our Erasmus office in Kyiv, uh, sometimes they report that not all regions are that eager to travel and uh, there are uh, students, some schools that uh, feel anxiety when they have to leave uh, their native areas and from what we see, our students, they already live this normal Erasmus EU uh, life they are eager to travel and to experience. We have a nice uh, network of university partners that uh, share their Erasmus programs with our students. Mainly these are universities of Poland and we are very grateful for your support. Also, these are universities of Germany and uh, Lithuania. Also, we have started developing the northern direction and we have our partners in uh, Finland and uh, uh, well uh, I can say that the main um, well like demand is well we have to uh, we select students based on the offered uh, specialization so that they correspond to the main uh, standards of the uh, Erasmus programs. Their uh, knowledge of language, uh, English or Polish or German. Also, we have uh, started double degree diploma programs and these programs are very popular here in Ukraine because they give students an opportunity both to get a European diploma and still have the connection with uh, Ukrainian system. So uh, countries, Germany, Poland, uh, Lithuania, uh, Finland, and uh, every year we have more and more students uh, who go for a semester or longer. And we are very happy that students from Poland and students from Lithuania uh, do come to study here. Uh, to tell you the truth, uh, they are very much attracted, well, like the scholarship they receive uh, is uh, a very good support here in Ukraine and they see that the country is safe, only 3% of our territory is under conflict, so we are very happy when we can show them the country and explain everything and make them cultural ambassadors of Ukraine back in the European Union. And the second question about English language proficiency, and uh, I did not mean our students because uh, Honestly, we are uh, satisfied with the level of uh, English of our students and postgraduates. Um, I, uh, when I compare, for example, uh, students from non-linguistic uh, disciplines who are, uh, when I was a postgraduate student, for example, with uh, uh, modern students, I can say that their level of English is much better. Uh, during the last five, ten years, uh, schools uh, paid much attention to the English language in the uh, curriculum and uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities, summer schools, lots of private language schools, universities incorporate English to all the uh, courses and programs, uh, but uh, English um, is uh, more a restriction for um, the um, older generations of Ukrainians who are not that eager, for example, for some of our uh, professors, for some of our people who can share much of important information about their subject, but English is something that stops them from. And uh, so we try to develop courses that are free for our uh, 
workers and uh, some of these uh, courses, they are uh, specifically designed to correspond to uh, topical needs uh, like law and English and so on. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Thomas, for your question. Uh, more questions to come? Maybe we will leave them for the closing discussion in the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a comment, actually, not a question, if I can. Oh, yes, well, it seems so. Well, well, I'm back. It appears that what you do here concerning Erasmus projects and your own projects is vital, very important. So I wish you good luck. Then. Thank you. <laughs> A new project. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's okay. start thinking about the new project and probably we will, we will invite our Polish colleagues to join us with this one. Thank you. Uh, so moving on with our proceedings, um, the next reporter is uh, Victoria Andrievska, Associate Professor at Lesa Ukrainka Eastern European National University. Uh, I'm not sure if I can read this title in French. Uh, Victoria, which language would you prefer to speak? Victoria. Okay, okay. <laughs> Great. So, uh, is Oksana Oksina here? Oksana Oksina, are you with us? Oksana Oksina speaks French. I can roughly catch the meaning, so, but we'll manage. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, Victoria, uh, please, uh, you're welcome. Так, я вже поділилася. Я невеличкий такий компроміс. Все-таки я хочу перш за все подякувати вам за таку можливість долучитися до такого проекту, до такого заходу. Безмежно вдячна за можливість виступити. І, власне, тому і сподівалася, що в такому контексті все-таки багато мов'я і плюрілінгвізм, я теж буду про це говорити, в контексті французької мови теж ну, представити цю мову, офіційну мову Євросоюзу, тому думаю, що це буде. Е, власне. Але маленький компроміс, не знаю, стосовно англомовних е, доповідачів і носіїв, е, я бачила, є налаштування субтитрів, якщо це допоможе, але для україномовних така дуже коротенька презентація, е, тобто, ну, Принаймні, такий короткий виклад інформації, аби була можливість хоча б... Ну, я сподіваюся, що навіть... Чудова ідея. Так, так, дякуємо, Вікторія. Чудова, чудова ідея. Власне, це мовна політика Франції. Бон бонжур а тус і а тут, а. Дон, мідамз і месію, жу ву презент, жу ву мон гранд онер, жу ву презенте. Mon exposé, який є антитулі ла лінгвістик політик де ла Франс ду вент і мінім сіклі, les enjeux et stratégies. Euh, je crois que le choix est assez logique, bien logique, en tant que professeur de français. Euh, je m'intéresse à tout ce qui concerne la France, les pays francophones, la langue et la politique. Euh, mais de plus, si c'est la politique linguistique, bien sûr que ça double mon intérêt. Eh bien, je dois vous dire que... Hum, voilà, donc mon exposé va se baser complètement... Euh, sur le discours euh, du président de la France, Emmanuel Macron, qui était prononcé euh, à l'Institut français, à l'Institut de France, pardon, le 20 mars 2018. Euh, et disons que le 20 mars, c'est pas la date comme les autres. Euh, c'est euh, la, la journée internationale de la francophonie. C'est bien logique que euh, cette date-là, euh, le président de la France a choisi pour prononcer son discours. Euh, vous avez quelques notions euh, de, de la francophonie. Je veux bien parler un peu de la francophonie parce que c'est la notion majeure de son discours. Emmanuel Macron porte vraiment une grande attention dans son discours à cette notion. Euh, la notion, est, on peut changer, on peut renouveler, on peut au plus ouverte qu'elle était avant. Voilà ce qu'il dit. Nous passons de l'idée ancienne d'une francophonie qui serait la marge de la France à cette conviction que la francophonie est une sphère dont la France, avec sa responsabilité propre et son rôle historique, n'est qu'une partie agissante, volontaire, mais consciente de ne pas porter seul le destin, euh, destin du français. Dans les médias, euh, le discours euh, du, du président Macron a très vite reçu euh, le nom d'une ambition pour la langue française et le plurilinguisme. 
pourquoi Parce que ce jour-là, voilà, donc Emmanuel Macron a dévoilé une ambitieuse stratégie de la politique de la France qui vise à redonner à la langue française sa place et son rôle euh, dans le monde, mais dans le respect du plurilinguisme, bien sûr. L'enjeu de cette stratégie, c'est de faire du français l'une des trois langues monde du 21e siècle et aussi en atout dans la mondialisation. La stratégie, la politique linguistique de la France et surtout la stratégie élaborée et prononcée dans les discours du président de la France est élaborée autour d'un triptyque « apprendre » communiquer et créer. En ce qui concerne la première facette, c'est apprendre. Le gouvernement français vise à soutenir les systèmes éducatifs francophones. Je vais faire... Franco... Non, vous ne voulez pas... Je ne veux pas que Fabien ne soit pas Je veux que tu te laisses. Bon, peu importe. Euh, donc, soutenir les, les systèmes éducatifs francophones et pour cette mission-là, le fonds de subvention a été augmenté, a été doublé, voilà, à partir de 2018. Deuxièmement, deuxièmement c'est de renforcer la place de la langue française dans le pays où elle est apprise comme langue étrangère. Ça, c'est c'est un point vraiment très, très important parce que dans le cadre de cette mission-là, à l'UNESCO et au sein de l'Union européenne, une campagne a été lancée pour convaincre les États de proposer au moins deux langues étrangères dans leur système éducatif. En plus, le soutien de la France aux enseignants du français dans le monde a été renforcé avec le doublement de la subvention à la Fédération internationale des professeurs de français et la création en novembre d'une journée internationale des professeurs de français. Outre cela, le président porte une grande attention sur le rôle des enseignants dans la réalisation de cette mission. Emmanuel Macron appelle les enseignants de français des héros. Et ça, c'est un grand honneur pour nous, bien sûr. Euh, ensuite, c'est de participer davantage à la formation des talents dans le monde. Des talents dans le monde. Euh, voilà, au niveau euh, des écoles, de l'enseignement secondaire, une réforme du réseau scolaire français à l'étranger a été préparé afin de créer les conditions d'un doublement du nombre des élèves des élèves d'ici jusqu'à 2030. Dans le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur, dans le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur, un élan a été arrêté euh, pour accueillir dans des meilleures conditions les étudiants étrangers qui viennent euh, apprendre, qui viennent faire leurs études en France. Il s'agit de doubler euh, dans ces formations le nombre d'élèves en 2022. Euh, ce qui est aussi très important et euh, indispensable dans ce programme, c'est d'encourager les établissements d'enseignement supérieur français à s'implanter à l'international et à développer co-diplômes avec des établissements étrangers. Et pour ça, un fonds de soutien a été aussi créé. Facette suivante, c'est de communiquer. C'est bien logique que dans ce cadre-là, le premier point, c'est de promouvoir le français comme la langue d'Internet, la langue sur la toile. En français, on dit la toile, Internet. Donc, pour l'instant, le français, c'est la troisième langue sur Internet et quatrième, pardon, sur Internet et troisième langue sur Amazon. Dans ce contexte-là, le gouvernement français vise à créer une plateforme numérique mettant à disposition des élèves et professeurs de français euh, ainsi que toutes les ressources dont ils ont euh, besoin pour euh, enseignement ou pour l'apprentissage. 
Euh, le gouvernement français vise aussi à promouvoir euh, le français, les contenus en français, les contenus académiques, scientifiques et la présence de tous les locuteurs sur la toile. C'est bien sûr important et c'est de l'actualité aujourd'hui. Aussi, euh, sur cette mission, et cette mission est euh, bien la responsabilité des, de l'Institut français qui est chargé d'opérer un déploiement massif du réseau social des professeurs de français en ciblant 150 pays. Et je dois avouer que nous, les professeurs de français ici en Ukraine, nous avons la possibilité de rejoindre la communauté francophone des professeurs de français sur la plateforme numérique qui est intitulée IF Prof. Mon deuxième point, c'est la promotion des, des médias francophones. Je ne vais pas en parler trop. Ensuite, c'est l'encouragement de l'usage du français dans la vie économique et diplomatique. Là, c'est vraiment important. Euh, Emmanuel Macron, donc le président de la France, aussi le gouvernement français, euh, vise à promouvoir le français comme la langue des affaires et la langue des relations diplomatique. Pour cet objectif, les moyens consacrés à la formation linguistique des hauts fonctionnaires et personnalités politiques de l'Union européenne qui se trouvent à Bruxelles ont été augmentés. Euh, aussi, bien sûr, je vais parler un peu de Brexit. Je crois que euh, le discours d'Emmanuel Macron était aussi lié avec les événements qui se sont passés euh, dans, à l'Union européenne et surtout ce qui est lié avec Brexit. Donc, euh, sur Internet, euh, on pouvait vraiment, euh, on pouvait vraiment constater tout un débat lancé. Euh, en ce qui concerne la sortie, je vous vois pas. Est-ce que vous êtes toujours là? Vous êtes toujours là, vous m'entendez Vous n'êtes pas Non, pas encore. T'es Oui, oui. Oui, oui. D'accord. Alors, je, veux, je peux continuer. Voilà, c'est Brexit. Alors, donc, euh, dans ce contexte-là de Brexit, de la sortie de la Grande-Bretagne de l'Union européenne, euh, le gouvernement français est convaincu que la domination de l'anglais n'est pas une fatalité. Euh, il faut justement, il faut simplement de retrouver aussi quelques règles, de réinvestir certains vieux et refaire du français une langue par laquelle on accède à toutes ces opportunités dont j'ai parlé récemment. Euh, la facette troisième et dernière facette s'est créée. Donc, dans ce cadre-là, euh, le gouvernement français vise à promouvoir les contenus culturels français à l'étranger. C'est la mission de l'Institut français et du réseau des alliances françaises. Je crois que vous avez bien entendu parler des alliances françaises. C'est un réseau culturel et éducatif qui promouvoit euh, la langue française dans le monde. Ici en Ukraine, il y en a plusieurs aussi et également. Deuxième, c'est de euh, soutenir la création dans le monde francophone, de soutenir des artistes, des, des peintres, des écrivains francophones partout dans le monde. Et l'Institut français également a créé un fonds spécial qui sera investi pour le soutien des jeunes artistes. Euh, deuxième point, troisième, je crois, c'est décloisonner les espaces culturels des pays francophones et favoriser la mobilité des talents. Dans ce contexte-là, le gouvernement français a déjà programmé euh, l'organisation du premier congrès mondial des écrivains de langue française. De plus, pour valoriser le métier de traducteur, un grand prix euh, national de la traduction a été créé afin de distinguer un traducteur d'une langue étrangère vers le français. Ce qui est euh, surtout important pour nous, c'est la circulation des talents, des jeunes talents scientifiques dans l'espace francophone, est aussi facilitée depuis 2018 par une circulaire qui permet la délivrance des visas de circulation des cinq ans aux jeunes titulaires de master ou d'un doctorat en France. Euh, le point aussi important, c'est de faire grandir 
la conscience d'appartenir au monde francophone. Moi aussi, je partage ce point-là. Je suis sûre que c'est un point important. D'abord, il faut vraiment se sentir euh, partie, euh, se sentir euh, cette appartenance à la communauté française de là, mentalement, et aussi c'est d'autres euh, manifestations et d'autres événements qui vont aider à ça. Dans ce contexte-là, euh, le euh, projet de renover le château de billets cotterets pour en faire une cité de la francophonie est déjà lancé, ce sera un centre culturel, et de plus, pour faire entrer plus largement la culture francophone dans les universités, un mouvement de création de chartes francophones a été lancé. Et en petit, euh, en petit rappel, hein, je ne sais pas si vous savez ou si vous ne savez pas, alors je vais vous parler aussi de ça. Une toute petite euh, mention, un tout petit euh, petit souvenir que l'année 2018, l'année 19, c'était l'année de la langue française en Ukraine et on a eu vraiment une grande, grande chance de participer à plusieurs événements, manifestations. L'ambassade de France, cette année-là, était surtout active et disons que c'était vraiment un bonheur complet pour nous, les professeurs de français. Et pour terminer, je voudrais bien que vous participiez aussi. Hein? Я всім учасникам заготувала фразу «Ля лянг французе е белі». Так, ми можемо це сказати. Так, «Ля лянг французе е белі». «Ля лянг французе е белі». О, ві, добре, добре, добре. Дякую. Дякую вам, дякую вам. Це був теж останній слайд мій. Дякую, дякую. Merci, voilà, diakoyo, et merci pour votre attention. Відразу ж перепрошую за хвилювання, це, звісно, для мене велика відповідальність, і взяти участь, і, звісно, представити таку мову крізь неї і таку країну. Та не все-таки, я скажу, що така відповідальність є і приємною, але все-таки... Ну, відчуття якоїсь тривоги, переживання все-таки присутні, тому теж пробачте мені цей момент. Дякуємо, Вікторія, дякуємо. Прекрасна доповідь. Ви знаєте, французька мова така красива і унікальна, ми зовсім не відчули хвилювання. Через цю мову, як мідіум спілкування, ми не відчули вашого хвилювання, все було дуже красиво, гарно. Я отримала дуже багато корисної інформації. So, ladies and gentlemen, можна ставити запитання. Чи будуть запитання до Вікторії Андрієвської? Я маю ще маленьку ремарку, звісно, і на перших слайдах було зауважено, що, звісно, доповідь базується на виступі президента Франції ще 2018 року і в контексті нашого та продовження нашої дискусії Більше, ніж упевнена, що, звісно, в деяких планах, так само в стратегіях і цілях, думаю, і ситуація, скільки всі ви чули і знаєте, так само Іспанія і Франція, в тому числі, в нас країни, які дуже, звісно, зазнали чималих втрат протягом цієї пандемії, цієї кризи, здоров'я, які називають в Франції. Тому, думаю, що якась ректифікація деяких моментів буде, але, звісно, все-таки лишаємося оптимістами. Ми справді, викладачі французької мови, і починаючи не просто так згадала цей 18-19, це справді якийсь такий був сплеск. Прийшла дуже гарна команда, оновилася в посольстві, яка займається, власне, нашим осередком і вищої школи, і середня школа, особливо під пильним наглядом. Ми відчули оцей, власне, те, що я казала, свідомість французької і приналежності до цієї спільноти, було чимало заходів. Вони справді роблять, звісно, і з нашого боку, чимало теж треба зусиль, але я думаю, що ми будемо продовжувати. Це справді мова, яка вартує того, аби бути представлена і на таких заходах, і, власне, в наших школах, вищих і середніх, і хочеться цьому вірити. Дякую. 
Дякую, Вікторія. Скажіть, будь ласка, за вашими спостереженнями після Брекзіт, от в медійному просторі, в франкофоні, в франкомовному, чи відчули ви якісь зміни в тенденціях стосовно популяризації французької мови? Чи скористались франкофонне суспільство тим шансом збільшити вплив французької мови в Європейському Союзі? Ми всі знаємо, що це офіційна мова суду у справах в Страсбурзі Європейський суд у справах людини. Чи змінились якісь тенденції, чи скористався Європейський Союз з можливістю збільшити вплив французької мови? Дякую за ваше запитання. Це була частина моєї доповіді. Звісно, вона була дуже так, така коротенька, оскільки хотілося представити все. В українському варіанті вона ще скоротилася, тому з того Brexit ви, ви бачили єдину одну фразу. На моє суб'єктивне бачення, я думаю, що ця вся промова була, власне, і оця стратегія, власне, під хвилю от цього виходу е Великобританії. Це, власне, оця велика і масштабна е промоція і кампанія, власне, для того, аби так, якось скористатися цієї нагоди, ну, це, це теж гарний момент, через те, що ну, якийсь стратег да, цим би не скористався знов таки. Так само працюючи над цією доповіддю, та дуже багато дискусій, дебатів, а чи зможе, тобто вихід Великобританії – це і позбавлення автоматичної англійської мови статусу офіційної, чи мови Євросоюзу і так далі. Тобто чимало дебатів, чимало дискусій. Звісно, Франція хоче, аби французька мова зайняла та або принаймні розділила з англійською якісь позиції, але ну, результат дебатів такий, що, звісно, цього не станеться. Я, власне, про те, що ну, від англійської ніхто, звісно, не відмовиться в спільноті європейській, але е, Франція так з цієї ситуації, я думаю, вона захоче скористатися, Буду вірити в це, що, що скористається, але, звісно, тактика дуже делікатна і дуже гарна, оскільки і ви говорили про плюрілінгвізм, тобто Франція не, е, не хоче вести політику таку, аби ну, виокремити та себе чи відтіснити інші мови, але звісно. говорити про прав, е, рівноправ'я і на цьому ж рівноправ'ї мати і свою мову французьку, теж як одну з але офіційних мов. Те, що дуже багато, тобто Франція, я говорила, там був пункт про мову економічного спілкування, та знову ж таки, щоб на рівні і з англійською були представлені інші мови, і в тому числі французька. Франція виділила надзвичайний бюджет для того, аби підготувати, ну, забезпечити, власне, цей інструмент, навчити французької мови, Цілий корпус як дипломатів, та дипломатичний корпус, так само і, як французи називають, великих акторів в економічній сфері. Тобто вони, власне, в це інвестують, аби той комерційний, торговий світ і дипломатичний був теж франкомовним. Вони максимально, власне, я говорила про, і на початку ви бачили, організація, міжнародна організація франкофонії, дуже теж потужний такий інститут власне, які займаються промоцією французької мови, в цьому році відсвяткував 50-річчя, 20 березня, відсвяткував 50-річчя, і не знаю, чи ви бачили, але теж Франція, максимальне посольство Франції е, за, залучило до привітання франкомовних послів інших країн. Це було теж приємно, особливо на та коли там посли Японії, посли знову якихось... Е, там, чи Америки, чи Штатів, та, говорять французькою, це теж дуже гарно. Тобто вони оце реактивують, вони шукають. Так, все ж таки, так, в світі е, французька вивчається і широко, як другу мову багато-багато країн. І в Штатах так само вчать. І тому багато є носіїв, власне, на таких щаблях є носіїв французької мови. І ну, Франція теж хоче про поширювати та популяризувати французьку мову крізь такі ну, персоналії. І, і ще був дуже гарний момент, тобто одна з стратегій теж, тобто Франція максимально хоче, аби та колись і в Європі, і в європейській спільноті, і в світовій одну іноземну мову вивчали. Франція максимально тисне на те, аби тепер таких мов було дві. 
одну, яку ви хочете, але інша – це французька. У цьому контексті, я думаю, що ми зробили теж дуже гарний крок в реформуванні наших навчальних планів. І я думаю, що ви знаєте, вже починаючи з нового навчального року, французька мова буде запропонована на вибір нашим студентам, першокурсникам, поряд із німецькою мовою. І ми дуже сподіваємось, що якщо не повна підгрупа, то частина наших студентів долучиться до підгрупи з вивчення французької мови. Тобто це наш теж внесок у розвиток франкофонії на нашому факультеті і в Луцьку, тому сподіваюся на, на подальшу плідну співпрацю. Дякую за гарну доповідь. Дякую вам. Тут ще запитання до Вікторії. А якщо запитання залишаються, в кінці у нас буде прикінцева дискусія. Я запрошую усіх ставити питання у прикінцевій дискусії. And we are moving on uh, with our conference proceedings. And um, it's my pleasure to invite um, Oksana Rohach, um, uh, an associate professor of uh, Applied Linguistics Department, Lesa Ukrainka Eastern European National University. The topic of the presentation is national values and beliefs in the context of intercultural communication. Uh, Oksana Oksivna, are you with us? Hello? Hello. Ірина Павлівна, тут її зараз немає біля мене. Можливо, трошки пізніше, якщо можна, щоб вона пізніше виступала. Окей. Окей. So, uh, it looks like we are going to move this report to our next session. Um, have I got you right? Is this what you mean, Julia? Yes, no, maybe. I think it's yes. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so um, then the last report from this session uh, has been moved to our next sitting, which is going to start at uh, 1 p.m. Ukrainian, uh, 2 p.m. Ukrainian time and 1 p.m. p.m. Uh, Central European time or Eastern European time, whatever they prefer to call it. Uh, now more questions and discussions. Um, maybe some questions related to uh, the issues that have already been discussed. Uh, dear conference participants, uh, questions are welcome. Uh, if there are no questions, just some more announcements with regard to how we are going to work on. Uh, our next session, as I have just announced, is going to start um, at 2 p.m. Ukrainian time, 1 p.m. Eastern European time. Um, the start of this lecture will be marked by a profound lecture and presentation delivered by um, Tomasz Zygmunt, um, the director of Institute of Neophilology, um, State Higher Education School in Helm. Uh, and then we'll listen to the reports. Uh, probably Oksana Rohac's uh, report will come next after this one. And then according to the conference proceedings, uh, I, uh, I would like to remind all conference participants that you are free to join any session up to your like, up to your uh, taste. But please be careful with the program and watch carefully the succession of the reports that are scheduled for each session so that all the participants are present just on time and we uh, we do not have we won't have to change <clears throat> the succession of the reporters and the succession of the reports. So make sure you know which day and which session you are presenting and try to follow us precisely on this day, which doesn't mean that um, you are not welcome uh, to join any other proceedings. And uh, I believe that during the beginning of our next session, uh, for the beginning of our next session, our students from Poland will also join us for the lecture delivered by uh, Mr. Zygmunt. Um, as of now, uh, if we still don't have more questions, so um, let me announce a break, um, just a, a almost two hour break, and we'll start our next session in the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you for the reporters. Uh, thank you to all the participants and uh, see you in uh, a little bit less than two hours. Mm, let's meet uh, again for our next session. Thank you very much. Let's have a break. Okay. Okay. See you in the afternoon. See you. Yes, see you in the afternoon. Bye bye. Bye bye.